This gallery has a standing screen which my father purchased about 25 years ago. What's interesting is that the middle panel is actually not original. Originally it just had a sort of a bit tatty silk hanging in the middle and it was only two years ago that the same dealer that my father purchased the screen from uh, found this one which is from the same era, so from the Tianlong era, um, and we thought it was a much more worthy complement to the standing screen. This is our object handling corner. So while we do like our visitors to be able to handle as many objects as they like, in the case of the vanities, this is not always feasible. So here we've selected a selection which is a little bit uh, hardier. So here um, we have a set from the 1950s as well as a few necessaires from the 1920s. This is part of our enamel gallery. Um, we've selected a few pieces from our Russian silver selection. I've always been really fascinated by Russian history and culture my entire life. So this is actually one of my very favorite galleries. We are so delighted and, and I feel privileged to be here at the one and only private museum in Hong Kong, the Liang Yi Museum. And look what I'm sitting on. I'm sitting on a Ming Dynasty <laughs> Huang Hua Li chair. Um, and, I'm, and to be able to um, talk to the steward of this whole place, Miss Lin Fong. So Lin is the director of Liang Yi Museum. And, one, and, and the museum is named after the founder um, Peter Fong and the two children. Um, she completed her bachelor and master degree in literature in Chicago and London before returning to Hong Kong and holding like an um, editor position in a famous magazine like Tedler. Um, the museum itself is a private one and it's uh, over 20,000 square foot with an exhibition base, a space that holds uh, treasures from uh, ranging from Chinese furniture, European vanity cases, antique silvers, and Japanese work, work of art, etc. Um, open since 2014, mm -hmm. Lynn, you have been the director of the museum. Mm -hmm. And we are like just really um, curious to understand the, your, your, your career, your growth, and, and witnessing um, a private museum here in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. But before that, like I, I see that when we walked in, there's a beautiful exhibition that is going on here, mm -hmm. named Beneath the Service, mm -hmm. um, Chinese inlay, Japanese maquillé, mm -hmm. European uh, uh, cloisonné enamel. Yeah. Can you Quite explain? A mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> Can you give us a bit of a briefing yeah. on this show? So basically, this is one of the first exhibitions that we have done where we really focus on technique. So previous exhibits, um, we've drawn from our permanent collections of, you know, as you say, Chinese furniture, um, European vanities, silver, etc. Um, and we always try to tell a story um, through the collections. So for example, one of the earliest shows that we did was called um, Tables and Chairs, where we only utilized um, tables and chairs from our Chinese collection to tell the story of how the evolution of um, the Chinese people went from sitting on the ground, like all of Asia, to then sitting on chairs and sort of the hierarchy that um, different chairs denote. So for example, you know, this is called a Southern official armchair because the hat, it looks like a Southern official's hat. Um, I yes. see the hat with a long chair. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I never know that. Yeah, so these chairs were, you know, quite formal. Very for comfortable. Yeah, yeah, it forces you to sit up straight, which I think is always quite interesting because, you know, these are formal official chairs, so you can't exactly slouch or, you know, read a newspaper in it. Um, but so, yeah, we would try to use exhibits to tell stories um, about society. Um, this time, we decided to kind of go a little bit more into the detail of craftsmanship. So the Yi Museum, basically, we work with three keywords. Um, design, heritage, and craftsmanship. So heritage is quite easy because a lot of our collections are antiques. Um, design, you know, is a little bit more subjective, but this time we really wanted to kind of do a laser focus on craftsmanship. So we look at Chinese inlay. So I don't know if you can see here, but you know, this is Chinese inlay. Uh, Japanese maquillé at the back. Mm. 
and then um, European types of enameling, which I think uh, your audience is probably the most familiar with. Mm. Well, now we are in the in the pandemic during the pandemic, when people want to come to see, they will have to make a reservation, mm -hmm. and then I believe there are uh, docent tours, mm -hmm. so they will be guided. Mm -hmm. And what is the reason for that? Um, I have to say we were very um, well equipped to handle the pandemic because we've actually always um, asked people to make appointments um, to come visit with us. The reason is basically when we decided to open the museum, we thought really long and hard about what our USP would be. You know, we don't have necessarily the largest collections in the world, um, though our Chinese furniture is definitely in the top five. But, we, you know, I wanted to kind of, since we have the leeway of being a private museum, how do we make ourselves a little bit more unique? And as you said, um, my background is in literature. So for me, I've always very strongly believed in the power of storytelling and of narratives. So the idea came around that, okay, what if we took appointments only and we invited people to come in almost like guests to our home? and we walk around all the exhibits and all the galleries and invite people to touch them and tell them stories rather than just you know, ask them to kind of read tiny, tiny little information cards at, you know, about what era they're from and what material and expect people to kind of just you know, automatically understand. Um, I thought that was not too likely, especially because a lot of the things that we collect are not extremely well known. You know, one of our Japanese collections is of uh, hair combs or tobacco pipes. You, you can't expect sort of like a lay person to come in with so much background knowledge that they can look at a tiny little piece of information and say, oh, 1865, made of silver. That's interesting. <laughs> you know, it's not really. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, it is hard. But going back to um, like managing the museum for mm -hmm. now, like you did mention, like you, you are very well equipped to manage uh, to handle this um, waves of pandemic. Mm -hmm. But um, the the museums in Hong Kong, including this one, mm -hmm. has been ordered to close a couple of times mm -hmm. uh, in the past three uh, th three waves of pandemic in Hong Kong. Yeah. How did you manage um, the shutdown of the museum so suddenly? Yeah. Well, luckily, um, we actually even before any of this had happen, um, we had in the works of um, coming up with a few new catalogs. So we were cataloging our silver collection, um, which we haven't previously done so before, and we were actually also revamping our website. So when we had to shut down, thankfully, we were still able to carry on with that kind of work um, at home. But then also it kind of forced us to, I suppose, enter the digital age a bit more quickly. Yeah. Um, so we uploaded a lot of virtual exhibitions of our previous exhibits. Um, we decided to make all the essays and all our previous exhibition catalogs available free of charge online as a PDF. Um, so I mean, it, it was good, I think, because like you said, it helps us remain relevant. Um, I hope that we managed to entertain people while they were stuck at home. Um, and yeah, it made our website actually a lot more sort of you know open and accessible to people in general. But in terms of um, social distancing, mm -hmm. um, even with the um, now with the museum um, having the chance to reopen again, mm -hmm. how do you survive this social distancing rule? Well, for us, it's also easy because even before the pandemic, we've always had a ratio of one docent to you know maximum five guests. Um, we preferred it to be four just because you know we realize that different people are interested in different things and if you have a larger group it's a little bit like herding cats or school children um, and we really wanted everyone's experience to be very personalized um, and very kind of unique to what they want to find out so we've never actually really allowed huge groups so for us, the social distancing rules, you know, when they said only two people at a time, okay, that was a little bit unusual. But now that it's gone back up to four, we're pretty much operating the way that we've always done. You mentioned that, like, you consider yourself a steward of the Liang Yi collection. Yeah. And uh, you like to see yourself as the interpreter of the traditional craftsmanship of modern day audiences. Mm -hmm. um, can you share more about this with us? Like, how, yeah. what are you thinking behind that? Um, so I get asked a lot in interviews whether I see myself as a collector or whether I also collect. And I always very firmly say, no, I don't. 
Um, I've seen, you know, through my father how collecting is, it's a lifelong passion and I almost feel like it's a calling. And so far, maybe because um, I see myself more as a steward and of managing these collections, I haven't felt the need to collect on my own. Um, so, you know, the idea of me kind of being the interpreter between these collections and a more uh, modern audience, I think comes very directly from my childhood. Um, so my father started collecting these antique furniture about 40 years ago, so before I was born. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so he started putting them around at home. Um, and you know, it started as one or two footstools, and then sort of like one or, or two chairs. chairs, like here or there. Um, and of course, as a child, you would be curious. You know, you would say, "Oh, Dad, what what is this thing? Like, it doesn't really go with the rest of our furniture. You know, why is it shaped so funny, or why is it so uncomfortable compared to a sofa?" Um, and then my father would kind of just very organically explain to me, only if I asked or showed interest, um, oh, well, you know, these chairs are very unique because, you know, they don't use nails, they don't use glue, um, they're very different to what we think of now as a modern chair. And, you know, as a child, I'd be like, oh, okay, it's interesting, kind of, I guess. So getting back to your question, I kind of feel that um, when we opened the museum, I was a little bit concerned that the natural audience for this type of furniture kind of skewed towards, you know, a slightly more mature audience, um, you know, maybe like 50. Basically, I envisioned my dad's friends. Yes. And I thought, oh, well, that's no way to run a museum. You can't just cater to such a tiny, tiny niche of the population. So then I really put it upon myself to think, okay, how do I make it interesting to someone that's my age, but more importantly, how do I make it um, interesting to someone that's even younger than me? Because, you know, they are the future. Um, so that's kind of what I see my role as. But I understand that, you, as you explained, you, you immersed with these items and mm -hmm. you have this uh, vision, but I can still feel that you have a strong passion mm -hmm. in what you're doing and you're not taking this as a job. Mm -hmm. um, how did you build this connection between you and the works. I, I respect the fact that you you have this background, but mm -hmm. then in terms of interest, how how, discover, how did you discover this? Because I would assume that people like yourself or even mm -hmm. me, like we would uh, probably fancy the very interesting um, modernist uh, Danish furniture, right. for example. Yeah. Well, I think um, we have such a large collection. Um, of different objects, it would be a lie for me to pretend that I was equally interested in all of it. I mean, I'm not. Um, but I think it's really important that, you know, I link it in some way to my life and where I am currently. So, you know, like you said about the Danish furniture, um, it's interesting because when I first, you know, moved out um, of the family home and was decorating my own flat, I skewed towards like, oh wow, you know, look at all this Danish mid-modern furniture, these chairs, like everybody else in the world. I fell in love. Um, and then it didn't really occur to me uh, for a while why they felt so familiar um, and why I gravitated towards them so naturally until, you know, one day I looked at one and I thought, hang on a second, this is almost identical to a Chinese classical horseshoe armchair. Really? You know, the shape, the simplicity. Mm. And then when I read more into it, and then when I went to Copenhagen um, one year for Christmas, I visited the Danish Design Museum, and they have this huge gallery, um, really cool actually, of kind of chairs hanging from walls. Mm. But it traces how these Danish designers actually took um, inspiration, direct inspiration from Chinese Ming furniture. Oh, and I like mean, this one. Yeah, and I think for a lot of people, like this is not news. Mm. <laughs> for me it was, and it was an educational experience. And, you know, yeah, that was when I was like, oh, it's interesting because basically I had absorbed all of this uh, background knowledge, but also this love for a certain aesthetic without even realizing why. Mm. Um, and then another example that I could give is, um, and also travel related, which, you know, seems like another a lifetime ago now. <laughs> but um, I remember a few years ago, I had gone to Iran um, with uh, my now husband, but also friends who are um, Iranian. And this was, I 
think when Obama was actually still president, so okay. it was very open. Yes. Um, and we could go see it, and again, like my mind was blown. It's such an incredible country, so beautiful. The architecture. So much history to it. And, so and much history. Um, just anything you see must have been, I don't know how many years yeah. old. And just like, you know, for me, previous to going to Iran, I would say like the Taj Mahal or the Blue Mosque were the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. But they were, you were also surrounded by a million people. You go to Iran, you go to Isfahan, you see monuments like that, and you're one of 10 tourists. I mean, it's just, so it's incredible. And I thought, oh, wow, I'm so lucky to be able to see this. How can I connect this to my work, to my job? So then we ended up curating um, an exhibition called The Blue Road, where we brought Persian objects from all over the world to Hong Kong. And uh, by on loan, yeah, on loan. Um, and That's I mean, major. It was a lot of work, but so much fun. And uh, I really immersed myself in, into it. Um, I spent the whole year, you know, like reading books, novels, movies, like all, Ara all Iranian, all Persian. Like ate a lot of Persian food. But yeah, I mean, I yes. think that's how kind of... I saw um, that exhibition, I remember, yeah. yes. When you ask me what the passion for my job is, I think it is really important that I kind of link it to my current interests as well. As you mentioned, like at Lang Yi, your focus on craftsmanship, design, and heritage would be um, continuing. Mm -hmm. As just second generation steward, mm -hmm. uh, what is your vision? Uh, I want to understand more what's sufficient in bringing heritage and um, culture to modern world. For me, I think again, sort of because I have such a love for literature, um, it also generally tends to kind of, you know, mean that I also have a real love for history. I find it absolutely fascinating to think and look at how people used to live and how that shapes the way that we live our lives now. And I actually think, you know, because of the pandemic, there is a huge element of everyone slowing down. And, you know, kind of Zoom calls aside and digital things aside, I think people are kind of moving back into a sort of more old fashioned way of living, you know, people doing things like baking bread again, yeah. um, and you know, like some so DIY, much detail like carpentry it. at home. I mean, it's amazing, but I think, yeah, so this is actually putting us more in line with a more old fashioned way of life. And how does that uh, change your vision to like, I mean, host your shows and going forward? Well, I mean, yeah, to answer your question more directly, I would say, you know, for me, if you don't, you know, it's a very common saying, if you don't know the past, you can't move forward. Um, and I think with wh everything that we do with our exhibits, we kind of really try to focus on elements of the past that we think are, you know, useful or in some way inspirational um, to how we live our lives now, even mm. though it's a completely different setting. In terms of uh, antiques, mm -hmm. then of course we come general sense, we, it will this topic will always come about in mm. anyone's head. Mm. It's about authenticity mm. and um, and vetting. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you have thousands and thousands of pieces here. Mm -hmm. What kind of views can you share with us? Like perhaps if you may, like what kind of process it, it has to go through right. before you guys would collect something? Okay. Um, so my father, whenever he looked to acquire something, he would always ask himself, um, is this unique? Is it rare, basically? Um, is it beautiful? And is it authentic? So those are always sort of the three questions he would ask himself. So, you know, is it rare is something that's very easy to answer. So that's kind of the easiest research. hurdle you mm -hmm. know, to clear. Is it beautiful? Um, I mean, that's entirely subjective. And I think actually, um, you know, as a collector, that's really important because I find, you know, just watching him and other collectors I know that if you don't collect something that's beautiful to you, then it kind of, you know, the value actually decreases because what if it's not as important as you wanted it to be? Well, if it's still beautiful to you, then at least it adds value to your life, right? Very true. Yeah. Very true. Um, and then is it authentic? Okay, so that's that's the big Million one. dollar question. Yeah, that's the big one. Um, for Chinese furniture, it's really interesting because for, you know, most of Chinese history, the people that created um, this type of furniture were 
you know, craftsmen and artisans. They weren't seen as artists as such. Right. So they wouldn't necessarily put their names to it. There's no sort of branding, um, which is really unlike European furniture. You know, dating back from sort of the 16th, 17th uh, century, you would already be like, oh, this is by so and so. Um, so for China and Chinese furniture, it's more kind of looking at the material. Um, so we collect primarily Huanghuali, which is you know this type of uh, rosewood. Very, and uh, very uh, sturdy and yes, very hard. Hard, yeah. Um, and Zitan, which is Zitan. a cherry wood, yes. um, which was used late in the Qing Dynasty. So these were very rare and precious woods. They're rare because, like you said, they're very hard because they take so long to grow, like so so long. It would take you know about three hundred years to grow a sapling into a tree that's big enough to make a table. Mm. So by that um, sense, it's very rare, but also it's kind of easier to authenticate because then you just look at how old the wood is. Um, there are instances where you, know, you would say there are fakes. For example, somebody could have taken a really long altar table and cut it and made it into three footstools. So that's Being what, creative. Yeah, and, and that's what you would call a fake. But actually to start um, you know, creating one of these from scratch using the right material is almost impossible. But one thing I did want to mention was, you know, because these pieces are, you know, for example, this is a Ming chair, so they're sort of two to three hundred years old, they obviously have gone through repairs. So at what point does it stop being you know, authentic? And this is an example that I wanted to highlight because I forgot about this, but okay. So this is an inlay chair, um, yours as well. Mm -hmm. And when we acquired this pair, most of the inlay had fallen out. So basically you would just have holes um, where this would be. So you knew what it was supposed to be there. But because you can see the shape of the exactly what's but they were behind. Fine. Yeah, because a lot of these, you know, would have been um, so, sort of coral or mother of pearl. So a lot of people, you know, thieves over the years would kind of take it out because they thought that was the precious, precious thing, which ironically is. Leaving behind the chair. <laughs> right, <laughs> leaving behind the actual precious thing. Um, so we actually asked, um, you know, the jeweler Wallace Chan? Yes. Who's also a Chinese furniture collector. Right. If he would be interested in putting some new inlay into oh, this for us. So is, are these from him? Yeah. So oh, both of these wonderful. are. So, I mean, I people, I suppose, if you were to be very, very, very picky about it, would say, well, these chairs aren't really 100% authentic now, are they? Because the inlay is new. So, I mean, I would say that's also, um, it's, a, it's an area that's up for debate. And I do think, you know, that's the thing about furniture is that they were designed to be a part of people's lives. Um, and they were designed to sort of evolve with you. And of course, it's furniture. It will get damaged one way or the other. And I think it's kind of, um, yeah, the story grows from how you then deal with the damage. Do you um, also work with advisors and experts mm. in authenticating pieces like other things from mm -hmm. Europe, for example? Because you, uh, the museum collects or uh, holds a collection that is quite vast yeah. and diverse. Yeah. Um, I'm just assuming that nobody can be, really be an expert of no. everything. No. Definitely not. Um, so for example, for our vanity cases, that's a little bit easier because um, a lot of the big jewel, jewel, well, jewel houses, jewelry houses, yeah, um, mm -hmm. like Cartier and yeah. Michelin and Van Cleef uh, made a lot of them and they are very meticulously documented. Um, so if you open one of the cases, you'll see, you know, if you see that it's signed by Cartier, we very easily can basically email or call them and say, hey, you know, we have this piece, we think it's from 1925, would you mind just sort of letting us know if we're you know, off by a few years or not? And they've always been extremely helpful. Um, and especially you know, in the case of um, these big jewelry houses, they actually publish a lot of catalogs as well. So for us, you know, if we see a vanity case that's quite similar to what they have um, already, kind of printed, then we know, oh, okay, so it must be from the same era. Um, but for things like, for example, we um, acquired some Japanese pieces, like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, one of the collections is from a guy who calls himself, or was called, the Vidal Sassoon of Japan. So he's a really famous hairdresser. Okay. Um, but he also collected um, hair ornaments. 
he built up this right and all yeah that. like absolutely Wonderful. massive collection I think there were four thousand pieces um, he passed away a few years ago and um, we were in touch with his daughter and you know we said we're interested in acquiring this and she basically said okay that's great but this is basically my father's life work and I'm not interested in selling it piece by piece you have to take the collection or none at all and you know my father being a collector himself completely understood this impulse and said you know no further persuading is needed we will take the whole thing um, and I said oh great <laughs> so <laughs> the storage would be pieces. my problem but yeah okay <laughs> yeah, fine yeah. I just got, <laughs> Lynn I just yeah, got 4,000 exactly. pieces I handled it bye exactly I was like okay sure Got it. Um, so we basically had to consult Japanese experts in the field to say, you know, this is one man's passion project, but keep in mind we're a museum. Um, we're only going to exhibit things that we, you know, know are museum worthy or of the quality that is comparable to the rest of our collection. So, you know, we had somebody working on this for about, I think, nine months to 12 months. And out of the 4,000, they basically told us a hundred pieces were top 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 quality like you know the best that the world has seen the rest are fun stuff <laughs> yeah. so yeah no we definitely had to work with people um, that are specialists in the area because like you said it's not possible for anybody to be experts in everything that we own how can one young person mm. or, or, or um, who, who fell in love after coming here mm. uh, possibly be able to start a collection being a person with a limited budget yeah and wanting to collect we all have a right to start collecting of isn't course. it yeah, um, not necessarily like um, like a, a big collector whom we envisage so really appreciate your thoughts well I think I would um, just share the story of how my dad started as a collector um, you know he basically started collecting Chinese furniture because he was told by my mother to go buy a new sofa for their house <laughs> and he was like okay all sofa. right I'm on it um, and then he realized he only found out sort of that day that before you can buy a new sofa you have to sell or get rid of your old one and actually you know back then this is before Asia expat or all these sort of like swapping platforms mm. you have to pay someone to come take your couch away and throw it somewhere and he thought well this doesn't make sense to me I want to buy something that when I want to get rid of it someone will pay me I'm not gonna pay them <laughs> that's so an then, interesting thought yeah so he was like I, you know this is what I'm gonna do so he came to Hollywood Road and found a pair of chairs which he loved he had no idea whether they were worth anything but he was like okay well you know I'm I'm into this I'm gonna bring it home bought at home and my mom was like I asked for a sofa you bought me two really uncomfortable chairs I don't know what you're <laughs> like these like up straight um, they're a little bit more sort of like inclined they're a little bit um, later so they're late teens so they're actually I think they were more like rocking chairs anyway completely not the brief that my mother gave him but this was my, when you know what piqued my dad's interest and he therefore spent the next 40 years basically walking up and down Hollywood Road every Saturday after lunch with the family just talking to the dealers you know he essentially um, spent however many Saturdays that would be kind of educating himself he started from knowing absolutely nothing about furniture to now being you know one of the foremost experts in the world so to me if you were to ask like how does somebody start collecting I'm not saying spend 40 years doing this but you've got to put in the time to educate yourself um, and this goes back to what I was saying about how I've always thought collecting just for investment to be a little bit of, you know, like a bloodless exercise. I feel that if your heart and your passion isn't in it, you're not going to be able to acquire all that knowledge because you'll get bored. And if you don't have that knowledge, then you're more likely to get, you know, tricked into buying things that aren't authentic or aren't worth what you thought they were. And um, yeah. So that means we have to have study and have some background knowledge uh, before really just jump at a piece kind of. I would say yes but then again the uh, the flip side of the coin is if you see something and you love it then just get it you know like True. get it first and if it spoke to you then learn more about it and then build your collection starting from that point like find out what it was that spoke to you
like I was saying about the Danish furniture chairs. Not that anyone can afford Danish <laughs> furniture anymore, but yes. you know, find out the why. real ones, right? The real yeah, ones exactly. Are. Like why that spoke to me, and kind of go from there. You know?